Hello and welcome to Standardizing Airs, a practical guide with Dapper. Today we're going to go over a brief introduction to Dapper, the importance of air standardization, the richer air model, the airs package itself, and then the state of where we're at today with our air standardization efforts. My name is Cassie Coyle. I'm a software engineer at Diagrid. And on the right, you'll see the Dapper open source team, which are my teammates. Let's get into it. Dapper stands for Distributed Application Runtime. It's a portable event-driven runtime for building distributed apps across the cloud and edge. It's a set of APIs for building secure and reliable microservices in a cloud-native environment. Dapper is actually the 10th largest CNCF project with a ton of companies using it. Our users and community says that Dapper is the backbone of their services. It does not have a lot of expense and there's a ton of payback. However, 53% of our users say that debugging and troubleshooting is really hard with Dapper. So Dapper offers 10 APIs with eight SDKs supported and over 120 different component types. This leads to a really awesome open source project enabling developers and distributed systems. However, there is that large surface area to cover and only a set number of maintainers and hours in the day. So yes, sometimes it is hard to debug and troubleshoot. But that brings us to the importance of air standardization. It's important to return back to our users a very consistent and reliable and of course enriched air to enable a smoother debugging process, one that gives them additional context and clarity as to the, what the air is about, maybe what app ID is involved, the resource type, the environment, etc. And the same way that our users can expect that standardized air, it actually enables community collaboration because the air is also written in a very standard and common format. All of this leans towards being more empathetic to our users. Let's look at the inspiration for our airs package, which was the richer air model. You can see it here. It's a snippet of the richer air model developed and used by Google. We can see a message status containing our air code, air message, and relevant air details. Now let's take a look at all the possible air detail types there are, starting with our air info, which we require in Dapper. Then retry info, debug info, all the way down to our help link. Let's take a look at that air info since it is required for us in Dapper. It contains the relevant details, domain, reason, and metadata. All of our air detailed types contain relevant attributes that should be filled in based on where it's at and the code base and what makes sense for that air. Now let's look at our enriched air, both a before and an after. Of course, with an example using our PubSub API, there's a high level overview of just a simple example on our left, we see a Dapper enabled cart app publishing data to our message broker. Let's say we're using Redis there in the middle, which is a Dapper PubSub component. And on the right, we have a shipping Dapper enabled app where Dapper is routing that data back to our app. And so already you can kind of see that there's a few possible areas where errors could occur. And yes, this comes with the territory of distributed systems, but it also highlights why it's important to enrich our airs. Now let's take a look at a before enriched air for our PubSub API that we just looked at. Previously, if you were to run a GRP curl using a fake Kafka and a fake topic against our Dapper publish event endpoint, you used to get this exact error. Of course, fake Kafka does not exist and neither does fake topic. So I'm forcing this very simple error. 
We get back invalid argument and pubs of fake Kafka not found. This is pretty clear and PubSub does not exist, but maybe it could just in a different environment. So it's important to return back more actionable information to our users in a user-friendly way. So if you were to run that same GRP curl in Dapper today, we'd get an enriched error back. We get back the same error code and error message we cannot break our users, so we have to ensure that backwards compatibility, even if the error code, like not found, could make more sense. But now we get back those relevant error details, starting with our error info type, followed by a resource info type. Again, this is a simple example, but for much more complicated errors, this is super helpful and relevant to like give back more info and insights to our user. Even this simple example can be expanded with a help link error detailed type, giving our users very actionable information so they're a click away from enabling themselves actually. Now let's learn a little bit about our errors package which lives in our Dapper Kit repository. So Dapper is written in Go and is fully open source. So it makes sense that Dapper Kit is also written in Go and fully open source. So if you're interested, feel free to take a look. Our errors package is implemented using the builder pattern, which is a design pattern that lets you construct complex objects step by step. We already had a builder-like constructor making our error immutable by the caller. So we just doubled down, tweaked a few things, making it that builder pattern. Again, ensuring that backwards compatibility. We're not breaking our users, we cannot do that. Trying to be empathetic for them, right? And then it is based off an official proposal there in the Dapper proposals repo, if you do wanna read more about it. We did tweak it just a tiny bit to offer more flexibility while maintaining that backwards compatibility. Okay, now let's look at the consumption of the errors package. We start with errors.newbuilder, passing in our gRPC and HTTP error codes, the message and tag. Then we enrich the error with that required error detail type. We have helper methods for these, passing in the relevant attributes, and then we simply call build. This is our simple builder pattern. Now let's take a look at our implementation details for those functions. Starting with our structs, right, this is go code, so here's our error struct containing the error details, which is a slice of proto messages, the gRPC code, HTTP code, message, and tag. And then we also have our error builder struct. First, we call that new builder, passing in the error codes, message, and tag, fill in the appropriate structs, return back our error builder. Then we enrich our error with the required type for Dapper, which is the error info, error detail type, append our error detail to our error detail slice, and return our error builder. Lastly, we call build. For us, we need to ensure we have that required type, simple range over the error details, and then return our builder.error. So that was very important for us to return the error type, which is a standard and primitive Go type. To do that, we had to implement the error interface, and then it really enabled us to not have to manage an additional type in our already large code base. Now let's take a look at where we're at today in Dapper with our error standardization efforts. So far, we've enriched two of our APIs, both the state and PubSub. We did see that enriched error with our PubSub API earlier. And then I've opened issues in Dapper for all the other APIs. As you can see, there's quite a few, but we do have a lot of first time community contributors assisting in this effort. And if you feel so inclined, um, feel free to sign up as they are good first issues. 
how to build the future with us. Hopefully today you learned a little bit about the AIRS package, how it's important for us and benefits our community and how it might do the same for yours. And here's a QR code if you'd like to get involved with the open issues today in Dapper. Thank you so much. And I'll open the floor if there's any questions. And then on that last row, I put some stickers if anyone wants any cute gopher stickers. Thank you. was where is the best place for folks to get started in Dapper. We have a ton of docs in the Dapper.io docs. There's tutorials, we have a repo dedicated to quick starts, and we do have examples that you can run through in all of the SDKs. So if you're using Java, Python, JavaScript, Go, whatever it may be, there's a ton of like super great examples with readmes that you can look up. That's a really great question. Yeah? Three interesting things. One. I just wonder, does there any uh, similar efforts in other projects to the UV stuff, standardization that uh, UV as a developer can actually like, okay, uh, like something like a really something like uh, similar to uh, HTTP error, right? That like, okay, for whatever project uh, uh, you will develop, it's the same semantic. I'm like an engineer, boy. I'm also come from uh, the localization community as well. Okay. And I found that this can be actually very useful because if we can actually standardize this mm -hmm. and have uh, translations for these errors, right? Uh, you can actually just, and, and if it works for one project, you can actually use it for other projects. Exactly. As well. Yeah, so hopefully I'll answer all your questions. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, you can use this in other projects. I haven't seen other air standardization in other projects personally. We, um, one of my colleagues spent quite a bit of time trying to come up with the air standardization that we've implemented. And it, like, it is using those protos from Google. And so like, it is out there. I don't see a lot of air standardization so far um, and it does support like both gRPC and HTTP because like Dapper supports both. Um, sorry, what was the rest of your questions? Okay. Yeah, I can chat more with you afterwards.